See if I can be mindful enough not to touch this thing. You can touch it. You're optimistic. <laughs> okay, very good. Very good. That's a good start. How is everybody doing? just uh, having a leisure walk on the roof and uh, as I did every day and tonight the sunset was quite uh, beautiful if you notice if you notice and uh, there was this uh, beautiful streak this cloud that was going across the whole thing and it was uh, a very very kind of like a dense line it really looked like defined Cut. and it was kind of windswept this. and uh, it's funny because tonight's talk is about breaking down the compactness and <laughs> I thought well that's nice <laughs> with all the you know the classic you know, beautiful Indian pink orange pastel blue sunset <laughs> and it really um, it was perfect because it really uh, kind of uh, represented very well what we're going to be talking about tonight. And um, how to basically uh, see the things that happen in our mind, the hindrances or the distractions, um, and how they, they're not actually very substantial, they're, they're quite insubstantial, they're quite uh, uh, illusory. We believe in them and we think really that uh, they exist, but uh, the Buddha said it's like a marriage. <laughs> it's not really there. It is there, it arises, but it's just fabricated. We just make it up. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> That's it. 
Any opportunity to laugh is good. <laughs> and so looking at, at that sunset and seeing this thick line across the whole sky and then just like seeing how whip swept it is and how it's really just coming apart really. And we, we look at it from here and we think it's like that, but that when you take a plane, for example, and you see the clouds, and then you go, you reach the clouds, and then it's really different when you're there. It's like, uh, it's not as clear as it looks down the earth. <laughs> it's much more diffused, and it's kind of like, it doesn't really have a shape sometimes. And so you, when you fly, you can actually fly through it. <laughs> I just love how the pilots do that, just like a huge cumulus or something like that. And it's just like, <laughs> and so um, it's really interesting because from our perspective we think it's dense and then when we actually get to dig a little deeper then really we can see that it's really insubstantial and so we um, so we see that it was just uh, mentally created and Basically, this is what we're going to be talking about today. So we've been, so far we've been speaking about, we've been covering the whole path. So we were taking the Sita in the morning. I haven't really explained much about that, but uh, I'll, I'll get you covered at some point. <laughs> and, um, but we do take the Sita, the virtues or the precepts every morning and the religions. And so this covers the, the, the virtue of the path, basically. Uh, and then we have the, the samadhi pole of the path, the meditation pole of the path. And we've been pretty much kind of explaining this at length for the first few days. And tonight we will start a new chapter, which is uh, now Brown Padme, or uh, in Hindi is it Brahmya? Yes. Yeah. 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 So yeah, uh, this word, <laughs> wisdom, what I call discernment, actually. And another uh, threefold explanation of the path is also Dharma Siddha Bhavana, uh, which we've also been uh, doing. And I think later I want to uh, probably cover a sutta that explains the highest kind of generosity, and uh, that makes it clear that it's practice of loving kindness. And actually, it's, uh, it's quite extremely meritorious. Uh, so what everybody's been doing here is quite amazing already. And just a little uh, insight, insight about Dhanam as well is like, <laughs> look at this. <laughs> this was also Dhanam, uh, quite amazing. The robes I'm wearing, this thing, everything, it's all been generosity from people. So, this whole place. Is that robes, uh, is the laptop to use Karai, okay, dancing? Good laptop. This is also a clear kind of turning point in the retreat. We're pretty much halfway now, it's day five. Uh, there's only going to be, from what I understand, there's only going to be really like eight days really of real practice. So we're, we're halfway. So this also can be understood as the first was, for those of you who really like this kind of conjunction of terms, is Samatha. And now we're going to move towards a little bit more Vipassana. So a little bit more discernment or clear understanding about things. And so uh, I just think it's really interesting also because in my research and translation work, and uh, I just spent like, a lot of time in the suttas, and, uh, you know, uh, anyways, I could go on for a long time, but um, what I've noticed is that this word, like vipassana, is not actually used that much by the Buddha. <laughs> it's really a later kind of thing that came up. 
it's only like in the Theravata that you can see that it starts to pick up. And then later editions, then like the, you know, like the Anasamitananga and uh, later treatises like the Abhidhamma, they just took that term and just like threw it out like massively. But uh, in, in the actual early discourses of the Buddha, uh, he talks about it, but really not that much. He doesn't like explain at length what that is, really. He just mentions it a few times. So to be a little bit more precise, uh, we're going to talk about the Pichasimukhara, that is dependent origination. And today we will start easing into uh, this understanding of how does the mind work and how does our reality uh, come to be. Uh, how did we get here? What's going on? And um, how karma works also. And I often translate Paticca Samuppada as also causality, basically, just to kind of keep it simple. <laughs> Dependent origination is like a kind of literal translation, but <laughs> it's just how things emerge, like from one thing to another. So how reality comes up, how our experience is created through our own actions, basically. So that is just the law of causality. That's what I usually call it. I see life is a little bit of a thing. I see life is a little bit of a thing. I see life is a little bit of a thing. That's great. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> and so I, I really like this quote from Jaya Ashmore. Uh, it's not well. I mean, it's some. I took it from one of her a guided meditation. It's a, a guided meditation. And she calls it the ecosystem meditation. And I really like it. And, uh, so I just took it from, from that. So she says. If we try too much to count and name every sensation that we feel, the meditation will be dry and not sustainable. But when we allow ourselves to accept that the life we are in the middle of living is more like a living ecosystem, and it's in our care, then we could begin. We could be beginners. Being a beginner could be fun. Beginners at listening. And so this is what we're going to start slowly uh, unraveling, see what this ecosystem is made up of. And uh, really, I, I love this uh, kind of analogy of the ecosystem because it's really impersonal. It's just a, a bundle of things that are put together, and it, it makes up this whole complex of body and mind, but it's just, you know, there's uh, blood running in your veins. Are you doing it? Your heart is beating. Are you thinking about that? <laughs> your breathing, sometimes it's conscious. Most of the time, are you really thinking about your breathing? <laughs> so it's really funny, actually. <laughs> this thing is just like, oh, this is happening. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, like, I want my arm to be longer. It's not going to be longer. <laughs> I have no power for that, like zero. <laughs> but we think that's me. <laughs> and that's funny. <laughs> Sorry. Did <laughs> you? So I'm reading a lot from just basically my book that uh, that's not uh, out yet, but um, if you guys want to see that again, it will be there. And so I also love this part where she's uh, actually saying uh, becoming beginners, uh, which is just like so simple and it's quite effortless and it's fun. <laughs> and then she says, beginners at listening, and that's even more beautiful, I think. This is uh, touching upon the presence of mind, really. 
this uh, listening, like this awareness, this sati, is, is literally in listening, basically. Because when we listen, we can't be talking. We can't be doing things. If you're really listening, you're listening. <laughs> so for me, awareness, sati, or if you want to call it mindfulness, presence of mind, is really this aspect of listening. And that's also really beautiful. So beginners don't, you know the expression like a beginner's mind basically, it's just like, you know, you're going all in and it doesn't matter. <laughs> you're just like, you're just going with whatever is happening and you're not actually thinking so much, you're just having fun. And so that's so important in our practice. And tonight I will be reading the Ball of Honey. The Madhu Vindika Sutta. This is Majjhima Nikaya number 19. And I think this particular discourse is really good for um, giving a foundational uh, understanding of what dependent origination is without becoming too dry about it. <laughs> Maybe that's what all these scholars do. What is it in Hindi? Pratitya. Uh, okay. Good. It's my lesson. <laughs> you guys are teaching me. Good. What was today? Hasna. Hasna. Muskaranari. Hasna. 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 Muskaranari. Muskaran. Muskaran. Muskurana. All good. All set. <laughs> Very good. I like it already. <laughs> so now the Buddha has a lot of suttas, he goes, he goes for alms in the morning. I can't remember where this is, I'm going to skip the introduction just to keep it short. Kapila Wattu, so he, that's his uh, birth town, basically, his home. And then this man, Dandapan, tries to, uh, wants to follow him. And um, he's just walking with a stick and going to the great wood and to ask the Buddha some questions. And uh, at that time, it was a normal practice to go to uh, spiritual practitioners and kind of debate with them, and, like, just check out their views and see if you can like, uh, poke at them, and, uh, see if you can win over a discussion. So uh, that's the setting. And the Pani is just an old man with a stick. <laughs> He's a Pani now, I think. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I can't remember the, the relationship with whoever it is. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I don't read the commentaries. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> Sorry. In Hungary, Kapila Vantu Okay. So then, leaning on his stick and keeping a stand beside the awakened one, he asked, so what do you say, monk? What do you teach? And the Buddha replied, I teach in a way, friend, that not in this world with its devas, maras, or brahmas, this generation of samanas and brahmanas, of kings and people, not in this world stands fight. And that this brahmana, the Buddha always talked about himself from the third person, lives disengaged from sense desires, has gone beyond perplexity, cut away mental agitation, and whatever he does, he is tensionless, he stuck beyond himself. Uninclined to any kind of conceiving, this is what I say, Brahma, and this is what I teach. When this was said, Nandapani, the Sakya, shook his head, pulled his tongue, Round his forehead in three lines 
and left leaving on the stick. So basically he was trying to debate with the Buddha and the Buddha was just like, I'm not going to debate with you. <laughs> I've got better things to do. <laughs> and this meaning like, uh, like an actual argument basically, it's not like a teaching, it would be like, like proving each other's points and all that. So he's just not interested. So he basically kind of sent him home in a skillful way. See, he's like the um, the other in the the other he's in the other group. <laughs> he's in the like this group. बोल रहे हैं कि वो चंद्रा करने वाले ग्रुप में ही मतलब बुद्धा के ग्रुप में नहीं बुद्धा के ग्रुप वाले समाइप वाले होते हैं तो ऑपोजिट ग्रुप में आओ Did everybody? Did I say that to everybody so far? <laughs> on interviews, yeah, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> I do, but I mean, to who I don't remember. So now the Buddha, um, at the end of the day, because that's usually the schedule of monks in the morning, waking up relatively early and then going to alms, and then finding a good spot to meditate under a tree somewhere or a rock. And then at the end of the day, kind of going back to where you live or live could be, or that's really how it was at the time of the Buddha, or, or it seems to be. And so he comes back to the monastery or wherever he was, staying at, oh, this was a Nigroda Arame, so the Banji or Hermitage. And so the monks, uh, he's basically telling that story to the monks, and the monks asked, but Mante Madhava, how can it be said that not in this world it is Devas, Brahmas, and uh, Maras, this generation of Samanas and Brahmanas, kings and people, not in this world stands by it. Pray, Mante, how does the awakened one, that Brahmana, live, disengaged from sense desires, Having gone beyond perplexity, cut away mental agitation. And that whatever he does, he is tensionless, without craving, basically, without desires, uninclined to any kind of conceiving. And this is his answer, and that's like the staple kind of a paragraph of the whole sutta. The propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind is the cause of a person's bewilderment. So, I'll repeat that, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. The propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind is the cause of a person's bewilderment. These concepts should, be, should not be delighted in, nor praised, nor indulged in. Here ends the inclination to discontent, the inclination to irritation, the inclination to views, the inclination to doubt, the inclination to pride, the inclination to longing for becoming this that, the inclination to carelessness and negligence. This is the end of being given to rods and swords, Fights and arguments, rivalry and fault finding, slander and lies. This is where unrighteous, unwholesome states of mind stop entirely. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, that he's just saying that. So the, the Pali for that is apancha sanya sanka. The, the apancha that basically the mental propagation or proliferation that we do of concepts and opinions and ideas and all of these views that we have, that is the cause for our own suffering, basically. This papancha, that's what we were talking about here. Papancha is the proliferation in the mind about this and that and the ideas and opinions and the storyline that we create about what's happening to us. The thing is that that's exactly what that line in the sky was. It's 
just this kind of dense kind of line storyline and we really believe it's true and we indulge and delight and take pleasure in that well to a certain degree but really that's a double-edged sword because uh, by doing that we're not really present we're not really at peace because our mind is constantly activating and this is also the root for all these inclinations, basically. So once we withdraw that, the propagation of concept fabricated by the mind, which happens at the six sense doors, basically all the time, which we'll <laughs> unpack in a moment. <laughs> um, that's where it all arises from. So any hindrance that arises, it's all rooted in that. And if you take the papancha out, if you find a way to understand the papancha, how it works, then you can actually root it at the root. And so that's pretty powerful. So now we've all, you've been all practicing for five days now, and that's really good. Now there's quite a lot of steadiness even though everybody's a bit like in different places, but that's that's normal. Although the mind is ready to understand these deeper uh, aspects of the teaching, and what it's going to do is kind of like gonna uh, basically break the compactness of those hindrances because because of the light of wisdom. Basically, we're just gonna shine the light of wisdom in that cloud, and it's just gonna if we understand it properly. So hopefully this is when, this is a really good time in the retreat when we start talking about these things and really vaporize those remaining hindrances <laughs> or begin to. And I just really love this sequence where it says, this is the end of being given to rods and swords, fights and arguments, rivalry and fault finding, slander and lies. All of these things, they just cannot arise if there's no papancha, if there's no fabrication of concept in the mind. So, and this is also where we start uh, understanding the impersonality of, of our experience, basically, because dependent origination is the way that the Buddha came up to um, basically there were all these doctrines of self at the time of the Buddha at the, at Ma, at, at Ma, yes. and um, basically he came up with dependent origination and said no this is how it works <laughs> and um, basically this is what we believe is ourselves but that's how it actually works and so when we understand dependent origination, we understand impersonality. And so we're talking about Ananda here. So this is our first step into the discernment part of the path. So in this uh, particular sutta, it's a really, really short sutta. It's the Anuttara Nikaya, book, book of twos, I think. It's called Parato Koso. And basically the Buddha says um, that wisdom uh, it's a question, basically, how, how does wisdom arise? How do we actually get to develop wisdom? And the Buddha said there's two ways, basically. There's one is from the voice of another, Parato also. And then he says, uh, and also careful attention, Yonisu Manasika. And that's really, really interesting, actually, because it ties in with we're going to speak a little bit more about this. Uh, that's a subject I like to close the retreat on, but uh, uh, beautiful friendship. And so um, the importance of Sangha, the importance of the people you surround yourself with, the retreats you're attending. Uh, and really, he's, uh, it's like basically that means listening to the Buddha. Basically, <laughs> like he's he's the like top-notch spiritual friend. <laughs> uh, like I'm just reading him basically, uh, but 
So you're, we're all getting his wisdom, and it's through his wisdom that we can actually get to understand these things. But if you just, if we just hear it and we don't pay attention, then it's worth nothing. So we also have to pay attention. <laughs> I like to call myself the Buddha's parrot. <laughs> so the Buddha just um, tells this, this line, basically this paragraph, and um, this is what the Exalted One said. The Happy One then stood from his seat and went into his residence. Then not long after the Exalted One's departure, the monks thought, is it not, friends? that the, the Exalted One, after having exclaimed this short statement, leaving most of the meaning unexplained, stood from his seat and went into his residence. So they're a bit bummed. Uh, it seems like the Buddha that day was probably not in the mood to explain a whole lot of things. <laughs> and that was actually a question earlier on the retreat is that, um, yeah, the Buddha actually did take uh, solitary retreats once in a while. He just said to the bhikkhus, uh, okay, monks, I'm just going to go into my own uh, residence and I only want to see the person that brings me my bowl full of food every day for the next three months. <laughs> and so uh, even, even the Buddha, uh, interestingly enough, seems like uh, he needed some time alone. So interesting fact. So, okay, so there's a whole preamble to this. I'm just going to skip over it because it gets long, I guess. So the monks are just thinking, um, <clears throat> okay, so who's going to explain this? Because like, we, we got that, but we need that to be a little bit unpacked because it's a little bit thick. And so um, they're thinking, well, the Venerable Mahakachana could definitely explain this. Uh, he's respected by everyone else. And so the Venerable Mahakachana was actually known, that was his title. He was the, the foremost disciple who could explain long, short, short exclamation of the Buddha, basically, who could uh, expound the short explanations of the Buddha or something like that. <laughs> So Venerable Sariputta was the foremost disciple for, uh, well, second to the, wisdom, uh, to the Buddha in wisdom, basically, and Mahamogalana was second to the Buddha in psychic abilities, and Venerable Mahakachana was foremost in expounding the short discourses of the Buddha. <laughs> so he's got an interesting title, I think. <laughs> so they go to uh, friend Kachana, and they ask, they put the the whole sentence here and they ask him to please expound the meaning. I'm just really like skipping a few pages here because I just want to keep it short tonight. Well, as short as it can be. So he says, the Venerable Kachana says, friends, just as a person who wanted heartwood, who was looking for heartwood, who was walking in search of heartwood, who would walk by a great tree standing thick with heartwood. And he would pass over the roots, pass over the trunk. He would, and he would think to look for heartwood amongst the branches and the leaves. So you come to me, venerable ones, when you were face to face with the teacher. <laughs> Having passed the awakened one by, now you ask me to explain the meaning of this. <laughs> Friends, the awakened one knows what is to be known. He sees what is to be seen. He is vision. He is knowledge. He is the Dhamma. He, he, he is Brahma. He is the teacher, the explainer, the carrier of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the master of the Dhamma, the truth finder. It was at that time that you should have asked the Awakened One to explain and you should have remembered what he would have said to you. Now they go through that whole list again. Indeed, Venerable Kachana, Maha Kachana, the Blessed One is all of that. 
and it was at that time we should have asked. Still, the elder uh, Mahakachana is both praised and honored by the teacher and by his fellow wise meditators. The Venerable Mahakachana is able to explain the meaning in detail of this concise statement left unexplained by the Awakened One. Would the Venerable Mahakachana explain it if it is not troublesome? Then, friends, listen and apply your mind closely to what I will say. Of course, Bhante, the monks replied. The Venerable Mahakachana said this, Venerable ones, when the Blessed One said, the propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind is the cause of a person's bewilderment. These concepts should not be delighted in, nor praised, nor indulged in. Here ends the inclination to discontent, discontent, <laughs> the inclination to irritation, the inclination to views, the inclination to doubt, the inclination to pride, the inclination to longing for becoming this or becoming that, the inclination to negligence, this is the end of being given to rods and swords, fights and arguments, rivalry and fault-finding, slander and lies. This is where unrighteous, unwholesome states of mind stop entirely. This is how I understand the meaning of this. So just so you know, I skipped that repetition twice already. I, it would have been mentioned twice more. So just, just letting you know. <laughs> I'm compassionate. <laughs> okay, so here, please pay close attention, uh, really, because this is quite profound and quite, um, it's not necessarily hard to understand, but just incline your mind to really understanding what's being said, because it can really open up a lot of things in the mind, so... Because of the eye and material object, visual consciousness becomes manifest. The meeting of these three is called visual contact. Because of this contact, there is an experience. This would be called Vedana, a sensation. What one experiences, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally propagates. And what one mentally propagates, this is the cause for a person's bewilderment by propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind regarding past, present, and future material objects that can be experienced by the eye. <laughs> it's a little thick, but we're going to go through it a lot, so you have enough time. <laughs> <clears throat> because of the ear and sounds, auditive consciousness becomes manifest. The meeting of these three is called auditive contact. So there is the ear, there are sounds. When that happens, there is consciousness arising. When consciousness arises, by the meaning of all these three things, that is what we call contact. Which one is yours? The sound? No. The ear? No. The consciousness that, that, that just arises from these two? The contact? Because of this contact, there is an experience. What one experiences, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally propagates. And what one mentally propagates, this is the cause for that person's bewilderment by the propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind. 
regarding past, present, and future sounds that can be experienced. So it's funny because everybody has their own mental inclinations. Some people see movies, some people hear music, some people uh, remember uh, things, um, some people uh, remember food. Whatever it is, this is what's happening. And this whole process is completely impersonal. There is a sense, a sense base. There is an object of that sense base, whether it's a sound, whether it's a visual object, whether it's a tactile object. And the stimulation, the contact of that, we're going to know it anyways. Like there's right now, even if I didn't want to see anything, it's just hitting my eyes and it's sparking up an experience, a consciousness, a contact, an experience, and there's a perception. Now, that's where you, we kind of have a choice. <laughs> when we get to the experience part, the Vedana, the sensation or the feeling part. I, I like the, the word experience because it's really like it's really kind of human. It's not, um, it's not so much in the head kind of theory. We're actually experiencing this and experience can be three, th three things. Can you tell me? Yes. Neither, yes, neutral. Yeah. So the experience that is going to arise from the sense base, touching the object and uh, creating consciousness, contact, and experience, whatever it's going to be, whatever we want to proliferate about it, it's going to be three things. It's going to be either pleasant, either unpleasant, or either just kind of meh. <laughs> not really pleasant nor unpleasant so that's the genius of the Buddha he's like no no but my car like it's really it's a Ferrari and it's red and it's got like it goes to like 200 miles per hour and you know it's it's doing all these things it's got this gadget and that gadget but actually that thought is based upon a concept which is based upon an experience and that experience is just either pleasant, unpleasant, or uh, neutral. So these convolutions that we create in our minds, these clouds that we just puff up, they all arise from that one factory. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's been like 15 minutes. <laughs> I didn't go into the the full chain yet. That's why I like this sutta. It doesn't go now. Okay, so I know in some schools that sounds pretty dry <laughs> because they're like, okay, so you have you know you stay equanimous with that. <laughs> you like it's either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, and then you just like that's it, and then just like uh, chew on that. And but really. Just so you can understand a little bit better, and that's something that I, I kind of uh, came to understand later, is that what you've been practicing here and now in, on this retreat is actually to turn all of this to more pleasant all the time and more neutral equanimity, balance of mind, steadiness of mind. So more and more, these experiences, they will mostly become, as we detach and become very uh, stable in mind and happy, most of what will arise will be pleasant and will not be too heavy, actually. That's, and that's why we, we're actually learning here to slowly get rid of all the conceptualization about everything that we experience at the six sense bases. That's anytime you have a hindrance, it's always that's what's going on. It's always rooted, whether it was past, present, or it's going to be in the future, what you're creating in your mind. That's, that's 
like so this, the beauty of the Buddha's teaching he's just like saying like hey this is like everything <laughs> and um, the Buddha actually when the Buddha says the world he actually speaks of the six sense bases and we all think like oh yeah like the world like the universe and all that but the world for the Buddha is the six sense bases because there's nothing we cannot experience anything without any of these six sense bases so it has to go through that but we need to know the suttas very well to know that when the Buddha says the world loka he's talking about the six senses So everything that we experience is always rooted in all of that. And when we understand that principle, it's extremely powerful. It's like having like the best shovel to uproot all the hindrances because we can just see it's a completely impersonal process and it's just arising. And when we see the way that it arises, it's really easy to let it go because we see like, hey, I'm not actually doing this. This is just arising from past conditioning, from contact, from experience, from conceptualizing upon perceptions that were experienced in the past, present, or that I'm making up for the future. That's all we can experience, literally. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing. And then what we do with that, so it's like um, we're practicing the, the six R's and letting go and cultivating the mind. And it's like um, tending on a garden and, you know, like, picking away the things that need to be picked away and but when we understand these principles it's like you know like taking the weed by the root basically and it's not going to grow back and it's like taking all the seeds away with it basically so <laughs> it's extremely powerful so the six R's is like it's the thing that we're doing all the time right effort but then as we deepen in our wisdom then we can actually extirpate and uproot these defilements at the very core and that's uh, extremely useful because of the nose and odors because of the tongue and flavors because of the body and tangibles then tactile consciousness becomes manifest the meaning of these three is called tactile contact. Because of this contact, there is an experience. What one experiences, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. And what one thinks about, that one mentally propagates. And what one mentally propagates, that is the cause for that person's bewilderment by propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind regarding past, present, and future tangibles that can be experienced by the body. And this is my favorite. Because of the mind and mental objects, mental consciousness arises. The meaning of these three is called mental contact. Because of this contact, there is an experience. What one experiences, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally propagates. And what one mentally propagates, this is the cause for that person's bewilderment by propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind regarding past, present, and future mental objects that can be experienced by the mind. And once again, this touches really at the core of the Buddha's genius where he understood that the mind also is fully fabricated. <laughs> Even this awareness is fully 100% fabricated. And that is uh, what we're going to explore later also uh, in the retreat. It is uh, made up, held together by Sankara, basically. And that mental contact arises because of causes and conditions. But that mental contact also can be released through the right causes and conditions.
And when mental contact is released, what happens? Nibbana. Yes. And that's very, you know, that's very important to understand. Like this is the awakening of the Buddha. It's quite, quite amazing. So, a very profound knowledge here. That's why he says in the Brahmajala Sutta, the cosmic net of wrong views, basically, the Diga Nikaya number one. It's just opening the whole canon with this, the Sutta Pitaka with that. And he's explaining the 62 kinds of wrong views that people can hold on to that keeps them in samsara. And he says at the end that any ascetic or Brahmin or anybody in this world would experience any of these views, even the view there is no self, even the, there is a self, there is no self, the self is eternal, the self is not eternal, it's neither eternal nor not eternal. <laughs> it's um, uh, all of these views that we hold on to, that one would experience that view without mental contact, that is impossible. <laughs> and that all these views, when mental contact does not arise, these views cannot arise. And so this is really profound. This is, this is talking about Nibbana, like what he discovered. And whatever view we hold on to, even the doctrine of no self, which is basically the Buddha's teaching, even if we cling to that, we're still clinging to a view. <laughs> we're still clinging to the view of Dhamma. And at the very end of the path, we need to let go even the view of Dhamma to completely... Yes, it's, it's like a raft. So we've built it, we've created, we've made a nice, steady, calm, and we crossed over the flood with it. But once we get over to the other shore, what do we need the raft for? <laughs> so we let go of that view also. We can teach it, we can talk about it, but to us it's, it, it doesn't, it's not... If we were to pick up the raft and lift it up on our shoulders, that would be a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> so, so there we are. So the Buddha's, that's so beautiful that actually in the end he says like, monks, you should not even have clinging for the Dhamma. So he's like, he's like, like even my teaching you should let go, you know, like what, what about even like all the other things? <laughs> so, so it's making that pretty clear. <laughs> So here's a, a little tweak to my translation. I, uh, I, I like this translation a little bit more than the word-for-word -word one. Uh, but it's just, a little, it's just a little tiny tweak. Basically, um, he's explaining here uh, how to how this arises, basically, because now we, we've seen like, how it works. But, now, how, how, do we, how does it arise? Like, how do we keep creating this? And then how does it not arise? How can we stop making that happen? And what I just explained about man mental contact and this whole process of dependent origination is knowledge essential to enter the stream, basically. This is knowledge essential to experience Nibbana. One has to understand this to experience Nibbana because that, that's what Nibbana is. <laughs> if we don't understand what Nibbana is, then, uh, then we can't experience it. <laughs> so, um, to a certain level, th this will have to be understood to really understand the Dhamma. And the Buddha said, one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. I like to say, like, see the causality, see the, the chain of causality. And one who sees the chain of causality, dependent origination, sees the Dhamma. And then in another place in the suttas, we have, uh, I think it's uh, Venerable Sariputta, who says, uh, uh, the stream of the Dhamma, the stream of the Dhamma. But what is this stream of the Dhamma? And he says, it is this eightfold path, basically. So, to, to really enter the stream, as it were, uh, which I think uh, will, will be a, a topic, one of the talks, uh, later talks topic, uh, to uh, kind of understand what it means to enter the stream and maybe uh, touch upon a few of the Arya Pugalas, basically the awakened people. How does that work? 
um, we, we need to know these things because that is the Dhamma. So basically, if we don't know the Dhamma, then, then that's it. We, we just don't know. Uh, we can't even think about entering the stream or uh, becoming steady in this. So we don't need to understand like the, the nitty-gritty of everything, but really, that's, I meant like the general <laughs> concepts. So how do the hindrances work? How do we make them arise? And here he goes, thus friends, feeding one's attention to the eye, feeding one's attention to, to shapes, and feeding one's attention to a visual consciousness. One can discern the awareness of visual contact. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of visual contact. One can discern the awareness of visual experience. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of visual experience. One can discern the awareness of visual concepts. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of visual concepts. One can discern the awareness of thinking. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of thinking. One can discern the awareness of propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind. Hindrances feed nekaranahe. Acha? I can say that. That's good. <laughs> okay. So, now you have an idea. That's where, uh, in the six R's, that's where Bhante always says, to the, in the release, you have recognize that your mind is distracted. Release your awareness from the distraction. Don't keep it there. Don't feed the distraction your awareness. And this is where that comes in. Because we feed them. So that's why we want to uh, be aware of that, recognize, and then move away from that. Of course, it's not enough to just see it. We have to also relax in the body because there is res residual tension. We, if we just keep it as a mental exercise, we cannot really let go of craving. It's, uh, we need to go through the body because there will be some craving left in the body. It always is possible to see craving through the experience of the body. Of course, when we're in the Arupa jhanas, then it's a little bit different. But we can still, meditators will still experience a, a, a certain kind of tension which will be more like in the head, basically. So is it really in the head? No, we don't know, but it, there's some bits of tension. And actually, even in the most clear levels of still clear mind, basically, we see that this awareness is actually dense. It's actually compact. And it's actually uh, full of tension. And to release it, is extremely blissful. Let's move along. <laughs> so he goes feeding one's attention to the ear, feeding one's attention to the nose, feeling, feeding one's attention to the tongue, feeding one's attention to the body, feeding one's attention to the mind, feeding one's attention to mental states, and feeding one's attention to mental consciousness that arises from these two. One can discern the awareness of mental contact. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of mental contact. One can discern the awareness of mental experience. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of mental experience. One can discern the awareness of mental concepts. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of mental concepts, one can discern the awareness of thinking. Feeding one's attention to the awareness of thinking, one can discern the awareness of propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind.
So at every sense door, and what we want to do here is to continually practice this understanding. Now, don't go thinking about that, but leave it just as, as like a background in your mind, basically. This is like a, like a kind of a program you leave running in the back of your mind, basically. You don't, you're not actually doing it like purposefully because that's going to become a hindrance. <laughs> Don't think about it. <laughs> that's, what he, that's exactly what he's talking about. But <laughs> leave it be and it will do its job. And when the time is ripe for you, you can actually just like take it out and just like remember that teaching and be like, oh yeah, right, that distraction. I'm actually feeding this thing. And just move out from that and enjoy the bliss that comes from Nipapancha the non-proliferation, the non-propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind, when the mind doesn't fabricate anything, and that is a very blissful state, where there's no hindrances, there's no thinking, and more and more we learn to enjoy this uh, bliss, and that's actually from a sutta, I'm not even making that up. <laughs> so whenever you're walking meditation, whenever you're walking up and down the stairs, I hope you are. <laughs> the four-story building over there, that's pretty good. And where, whatever you're doing, whenever you're eating, whenever, whatever you're doing, also this is the practice. Don't engage in things. On retreat especially, you have all the perfect, perfect conditions here to practice this. So remain detached. Don't engage in the senses. Don't engage in the papancha. And stay with your with your vehicle of awareness, stay with your bhavana, what you're developing, and the six R's. Because this is, now you have the key to understand how it's all arising all the time. And if you just cut it at the root, then you'll make a lot of progress. And so here the final step is how do we put an end to all of this? Not feeding, not feeding one's attention to the eye, to visual objects. And I'm just going to skip over this whole section because I think you understand. And it's getting late. So <laughs> there will be, um, if we're lucky, I will be reading the Chachaka Sutta, uh, the six sets of six, Majmanikaya 146, is it? Anyways. And it's, it's a kind of a guided meditation. It's not really a talk. I'm not adding anything to it, no explanation. But I'm really repeating all of this, or basically a whole breakdown of depend, dependent origination. And it's done as a meditation, guided meditation, basically. And so hopefully I'd like to, I'd like to uh, uh, squeeze that in. The retreat, uh, probably one of the talks that are coming is just going to be that. It takes about an hour, and then there's no talking afterwards. We just sit and meditate. And uh, it's quite amazing. I've seen uh, people literally uh, experiencing very deep states, like complete let, letting go. Uh, so it was, it's, it's, uh, it's quite powerful, and um, it helps the wisdom, basically, afterwards. In the Chachaka Sutta? No, my question was Sambhu that you would be guiding in English, so I'm wondering how would you yes. speak? Yes, it would, um, if there is need for a Hindi version, then uh, I would recommend not interrupting the flow of this basically throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, the best way to do this would be to find a Hindi translation and then to be reading that. Uh, I don't know if you can. And in the future, it will be very beneficial for everybody uh, in Hindi. So I would recommend that somebody volunteers and <laughs> translates the Chachaka Sutta in Hindi, or if it's not already done. I think it will be available. Yeah, well, basically what I was thinking was to divide the group in two. Mm -hmm. Basically, if, if those uh, want to hear it in Hindi yeah. and, and get somebody... Uh, to read it in Hindi in like the opposite room, like maybe kitchen side or something, so there's no like sound coming through. And uh, whoever wants to hear it in English can, and Hindi also. So uh, I think that would be really the ideal. 
and I don't know if we can do that. Yeah, yeah, let's find a way to do that. Good. <laughs> then there's gonna be like two people here. <laughs> good. Did I see? Okay, okay, good. So I'm just gonna read the last one for the mind. And so, but he goes through each of the senses again, but I really like to finish with the mind because also for those who are and will be experiencing the deeper stages of release, this is really important because we even, we have to hear these things about releasing even mental contact, even consciousness itself, because that's very powerful at that point. And then we, c we are sure that we're gonna have the knowledge that we need to actually take a step back completely, so. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Not feeding one's attention to the mind, not feeding one's attention to mental objects, not feeding one's attention to mental consciousness. One cannot discern the awareness of mental contact. Not feeding one's attention to the awareness of mental contact. One cannot discern the awareness of mental experience. Not feeding one's attention to the experience of mental, to the awareness of mental experience. One cannot discern the awareness of concepts. Not feeding one's attention to the awareness of concepts. One cannot discern the awareness of thinking. Not feeding one's attention to the awareness of thinking. One cannot discern the awareness of propagation of concepts fabricated by the mind. So this is where all hindrances are completely uprooted. This is how I understand the meaning of this statement, monks. Bearing this in mind, friends, you should go to the awakened one. Then he might explain to you the meaning of this and you should remember what he will say. And then they go to the Buddha and they ask and they, the Buddha replies, Monks, Mahakachana is wise. Mahakachana has great wisdom. You should remember the meaning of this statement as it was explained by him. Mahakachana has explained this in the same way that I would have explained it. That is the meaning and this is how you should bear it in mind. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda asked the Awakened One, Bhante, just as a man overwhelmed and weakened by hunger would walk up to a ball of honey, wherever he would taste it, he would get a sweet and delicious taste. In the same way, Bhante, wherever one is, if a wise monk were to call to mind and investigate the meaning of this exposition of the Dhamma with discernment, he would gain gladness of heart and peace of mind. Bhante, what is the name of this explanation of the Dhamma? Ananda, you can remember this exposition of the Dhamma as the exposition on the honey ball. This is what the Awakened One said. Glad at heart, the Venerable Ananda rejoiced in the Awakened One's words. Sad, sad, sad. So, this is the ecosystem. <laughs> this is how it works. This is how hindrances arise. And this is how we feed them. And this is how we stop feeding them. And in other words, the Buddha used the word uh, nutriment. Uh, we had this nutriment, this craving, this engagement in the six senses. This is how we feed them, basically. And if we take away the nutriment, then it cannot grow. It's impossible. On this, uh, I think that's enough for tonight. And... Um, there's a few questions on the table here. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but the one suggestion, like, uh, we draw one uh, circle of dependent origination as per your uh, wordings. 
Yes. Right, that a lot of people didn't understand. Yes. So basically, uh, in one of the next the next talk, um, usually we hand out a, a print of dependent origination, and basically it's a table. Uh, and I was thinking that everybody could write what I call these things, um, like on top mm -hmm. of the actual the old translation, so that uh, we're all on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I think that's it. And should I read these questions? Uh, yeah, okay. Question for Bhante G. If a student is practicing metta in six directions at present, but feels he hasn't done the first four jhanas properly, should he start again from first jhana with metta and gratitude? Well, that is very nice. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> but actually, not the first jhana. Should go back to the spiritual friend and don't worry about the jhanas. Uh, put the spiritual friend in your heart, practice the six Rs. Don't worry about jhana. Do the practice and these jhanas, they just happen on their own. Uh, we don't need to make them happen. So I don't know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> but keep going. You're doing great. And don't be afraid to start over again if you're confused. It's not a problem. Like, it's actually smart. I did that. My first retreat with uh, Twim, I was, um, I'm not going to say the whole story, but I was starting an eight month retreat at my mother's place basically, and that was eight months before I ordained Pabaja in uh, Damasuka. And uh, I was trying so many traditions and teachers because my meditation was not good, and I was hitting that wall and I couldn't go past, and it was. So it's the same thing happening whatever I was doing, whether it was called a kind of vipassana or whether it was called uh, absorption jhana or whether it was called whatever you want to name it. And it didn't work. I had massive tension and uh, it wasn't going, it wasn't getting better basically. And uh, I felt like I wasn't practicing very well. So, <laughs> and so. Um, when I heard about TWIM, uh, I couldn't believe that Bhante could just like answer all my questions like that. Uh, I'd been looking for that for years and here he was just like casually answering them. I'd been, uh, I was serving like the Paok Sangha came to Toronto in Canada. One time they did that and I was lucky enough to have a chance to go and serve them for basically over a week. And we went to like Niagara Falls and stuff like that. And it was kind of funny to hang out with all these like uh, Sayadaws and top abbots of monasteries. And because uh, they were inaugurating a new monastery in, uh, in Georgia, southern states, and uh, which I went to also after. And I was asking these Sayadaws and these, you know, like these Mahateras of like 30 years in the robes and they were just answering me with like straight commentaries and complicated and I couldn't, it was just not answering my questions literally, uh, sorry. <laughs> and then uh, I meet Bhante Vimaramsi, well, uh, his talks and I'm basically told by my friend, oh, you should check out TWIM, they have free online retreats and they're really great and uh, my friend got really good results and so I was like, okay, I'll try. And then I finished my uh, online retreat with Bhante Gunaratana. I don't know if you know him, uh, Bhantiji. And um, I, was, I wasn't even done, basically. He uses metta for absorption concentration, basically, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but it was slowly going to, towards the Bhanti Vimaramsi. And um, then uh, I, I listened to Bhante's talks, and I was just like, this, this man is just like answering like point after point all of my questions, like right on par. And, so I was really sold from the beginning and I, they, they didn't have enough room for me uh, in the first, like the, the closest retreat and I didn't want to wait. I'm that kind of person, I guess. <laughs> Wasn't going to wait. <laughs> so I saw that it was all online anyways. <laughs> so 
I just figured it out and I did my first retreat by myself without a teacher and um, my meditation went deeper in 10 days by myself without a teacher listening to Bhante's talks than my past five years of all meditation put together so I was quite sold um, but I was so in a hurry that um, because I did book an actual retreat with a teacher after <laughs> I just didn't want to wait until then it was in a month and so um, then I uh, my teacher was Prashant and then um, we just talked and I just like wrote this like I don't know like five page email to him like this is what I'm experiencing and like <laughs> poor him I'm sorry <laughs> But he was really kind and patient and um, so we just basically started all over again. <laughs> He's just like, okay, just take a spiritual friend and just like, let's do the whole thing again. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay. Didn't really want to do it, but I still did it because I just wanted to make sure that I was actually going to give a really fair and genuine try to the practice and really not miss a step because it's really important, especially for your own confidence. Then when you do that, then you, yeah, you might think that you're going back a little bit, but you're not really. You're going to really strengthen your confidence, your faith, and your understanding will be much more, much stronger. And that's going to really benefit in the long run. Um, so, so the answer is don't worry about the first jhana. Just go back to the spiritual friend. Take it easy. Have fun smile a lot and uh, laugh if you can smile or if you even if you can I mean um, and when people look at you they should think like that person is crazy like who's that guy that's just like a crazy guy just laughing all the time <laughs> there's actually it happens quite a bit like it's just like people just start laughing and like, you know it's because like really we're so bad at being happy to be honest like <laughs> but this is what we're doing here and then the practice when we're really actually listening to the instructions like actually laughing like it opens up the blockages you know like and and then we we're like an open page it's just, we just got nothing to, to hide everything is happy just like giggly and practice is fun and you fly through the jhanas basically so yeah, let's talk tomorrow, uh, Mr. I don't know who, and we'll see, uh, we'll, make it, uh, we'll make it nice, and uh, yeah, it's not a problem at all, it's, it's actually uh, it's a good thing. Are you going to translate that? Oh. Take a question mark. Oh, good. Step by step, Janahe. Okay, so next question by, uh, I really like the smiley face, thank you. Um, how to deal with external disturbances, noise, during the retreat? Well, what is noise? Ah, contact, consciousness concepts yes um, well there's really there's two ways of doing that there's one is um, telling everybody to be silent <laughs> to not make noise that's the first part then there is practicing what exactly what we said tonight uh, this is the way to let go of external disturbances because first um, it's true, this is a retreat environment and it should be quiet. But also, our reaction to these things and our opinions and uh, judgments is actually creating us problems in the first place. Actually, in Dhammasukha, Bhante was pretty adamant. Uh, there was like the lawnmowers going on like all day during the retreat and people were complaining and he was like, you're taking it personal. <laughs> Don't make a big deal out of it. It's just noise. You need to six R that. Because you're getting lost in your own story, your judgments and opinions, and you're causing yourself suffering. I mean, you could have told the lawnmower to stop, 
that would have been nice. But also the thing is, is also in reality, when you're going to go out in the big world, uh, you, we're not going to always have what we want all the time. And so here is actually really good. Uh, it's a really good environment. Although I have to be honest, I haven't spent much time in here, so I can't. I know it's really acoustic. Like the, there's a lot of resonance and tra sound travels quite a lot in this building. So I'm aware of that, but I don't know how noisy it is. I mean, I hear the highway where I am, uh, but I don't know. It's, I found like almost everywhere I've been, like it, there's always a highway somewhere, isn't it? Like there's always that, that kind of so at least you know like uh and i and i'm like a forest monk i like to be in the forest and uh far away from everything and still when i do that i still hear highways most of the time that's crazy so that's telling us like where this world is heading and uh just just so you know it's not looking good for the future <laughs> so it's probably gonna be more <laughs> more of that so it's better you learn to 6r <laughs> in the end short short story <laughs> it's better we start to cultivate the mind to let go of all that junk yeah and then that's really when you're going to be completely free from all of it you're just not even going to mind is going to be detached there's a word i don't understand shy shy ticks? Is there something nice? Do something. Shining. Shining. No. Shifting. No. Shifting. Shifting. Something shifting in consciousness. Shifting. Shifting. In shifting. 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 Is there something shifting in consciousness where uh, nibbana awakening is more accessible? In, in these times. times. Okay. okay. <laughs> Good. Feels like more people are also having spontaneous awakenings. Oh, that was a question on the last retreat too. Is there something shifting in consciousness where Nibbana slash awakening is more accessible in these times? It feels like more people are also having spontaneous awakenings. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, we had the same, uh, I had the same question on interviews at Bodh Gaya. Um, yeah, the age of awakening. I was definitely part of that group. <laughs> well, that's what they call the new age, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, practiced a lot of things in there. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. I'm seeing kind of both ends kind of. It's like one side is getting really intense in the, in the, in the opposite way. <laughs> and the other side is like there is like definitely something going on spiritually. Like there's a lot of people I think a lot of people are being reborn right now in this day and age uh, because of past really good karma in a Buddha era, basically, where there's still the sasana going. Uh, and I see this teaching arising. I mean, there's, there's a lot of side stories I could say about, you know, uh, really interesting experiences from people that ha are within this tradition also that kind of saw that coming anyways but i don't know how you know i'm always careful about these you know uh these kind of psychic things and because uh, they're also a ground for uh, delusion to arise so uh, i'm always very careful not to put too much emphasis on this um i would say that uh the buddha says this is samsara and um he discovered the Four Noble Truths for us to practice and to, uh, to uh, come out of the wheel, basically. Uh, so that's the first thing I would say about that. <laughs> Whatever day and time or day and age you are born in, that's probably what anybody should do who's, uh, uh, who's wise. 
then um, yes, there are, I mean, causes and conditions arise. I mean, the, just the Buddha is supposed, and I'm citing from the commentaries here, but uh, the, the Buddhas arise with very specific conditions on this world. Uh, the, like a Buddha could probably not appear like just right now in like the forest in Canada because first it's cold <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> like really cold and there's bears, but I mean that's fine. And, but people wouldn't know what to do with him. <laughs> He'd be this walking samana and he would probably die because nobody would feed him because they wouldn't understand what he's doing. But uh, Buddha it has to be, it has to be India basically, it has to be Jambudipa. And um, <laughs> it has to be the right, you know, the right continent, it has to be the right mother, it has to be the right culture. Uh, it has to have all these conditions for the Bodhisattva to decide to take its last birth onto the human realm, descend from the Tusita heaven. That's what the commentaries say. And it's the same thing, you know, it's the same thing sometimes in, in, in later in, in sasanas that are fruitful, that have uh, withstood this, the test of time, and we're witnessing it now. Buddhism hasn't been that strong throughout the past 2,600 years. It has gone through really big challenges. I mean, the reason why they put down the the Tripitaka in, on palm leaf manuscript in Sri Lanka. I mean, there's other places where they recorded some texts, but mainly uh, that was the place in Aluvihara, uh, that rock cave there. They were going through a 12-year famine. <laughs> and they thought, well, we're just going to lose this teaching. You know, like, I don't know, how, like, how long can we eat tree leaves for? Because <laughs> that's what the monks were eating at that point. There was nothing to eat. There was just like, it was a generalized famine, no food, and uh, Buddhism was not very strong at all. And, you know, Sri Lanka right now was flourishing. It's a Buddhist, well, <laughs> right now, no, but it's, it's, flourishing in terms of Buddhism uh, with Thailand and Burma and other countries like uh, Cambodia and things like that. But it wasn't always like that. You know, in India it was basically shaved off with the invasion in the north and uh, there's a lot of really intense history around that and we, like Buddhism almost was swiped clean from the surface of the earth many times. Uh, so. And uh, that's why, that explains also why the teaching right now is not always, you know, necessarily accurate what we get because it's been interpreted in so many ways. I mean, it's the same thing with Jesus. It's the same thing with a lot of people that were said to be kind of enlightened or whatever. And another really interesting point is also, okay, so what is awakening? Because it's different for many people. Like you're gonna, like, there's a belief, okay, so I'm not like an expert or anything, but I know that I, I, I practiced yoga a lot and I visited ashrams and you know, like they, they think that the Buddha is an incarnation of Vishnu. So, I mean, there's some misunderstandings here. <laughs> And it's not, to, like, it's not to be a critic about anything that anybody would say. And I believed he was an incarnation of whatever too. I mean, that's what I knew at that point until I actually learned more about the Buddha's teaching and what he was saying. And actually the Buddha himself was saying like, things very different than that. And uh, you know, what is awakening? What is enlightenment? It's very different for many people. Do all spiritual leaders that claim to be awakened really are awakened? When we hear about like these scandals that are happening and things like that. I'm not saying that this is happening across the board, but it is happening, definitely. And, you know, so it's uh, basically the Buddha said, you know, a person who's fully awakened, which is, means like an arahant, uh, cannot, uh, they cannot basically uh, 
have, uh, they cannot kill on purpose, they cannot lie on purpose, they cannot have sexual intercourse unless they're, I don't know. But it's not, it's really something that they have no interest for. So when you see spiritual leaders like of these traditions doing that, it's like, well, okay, we definitely have a different understanding of what an awakened being is, really. You know, it, it just, just the monks rules, I mean, that's, I just love that. We have four Parajika rules that if we break, we're not a monk anymore, like instantaneously. You're not a monk. You're just a person wearing a robe, pretending to be a monk. And you cannot ordain again for the rest of your life, this lifetime. It's just impossible. You're done. That's what it means, Parajika. You're like vanquished, <laughs> defeated, yes. And so the first, the first one is sexual intercourse. We cannot do that. And that's pretty stiff. Like you just have that and then that's it. You're not a monk anymore. Then killing someone or um, encouraging death over life, praising death over life. And that's why a lot of monks don't even want to talk about you know, con uh, contraception measures and things like that because it's getting really close and we really don't want to like be parajika basically. <laughs> and so, um, and then there's stealing anything that is worth more than five masakas, whatever that that means uh, it's probably like a few dollars. <laughs> uh, there's there's uh, commentaries about how much that would be, but it's kind of vague. And so, also monks will be very careful about what they take, because they really don't want to break a parajika of stealing, and the intention also is a really important factor in that. But the thing is, you know, if my intention is not to steal, and I just take this and you know go away. Um, it's fine, but you know, a lot of the time intention is not that clear. <laughs> so did I actually want to steal this or not? And then you have doubt and then, you know, it's playing with fire with a parajika. You can't even be a monk anymore, right? So, uh, so that's pretty intense, you know, like <laughs> the Buddha set down these rules and he said like, these are the rules like arahants would never break those rules because they're done with these things. Uh -huh. Yes, and the fourth one, and the fourth one is really interesting. It's about lying about spiritual attainments that you don't have. <laughs> so that's really interesting. And so it has to be, it's a double kind of, uh, it has two components to it. One is lying, consciously lying, telling someone that, and then and it's, it's about something that you actually don't have, don't experience. And that can be even just the first jhana. So even if you were to say like, uh, and that's why monks don't talk about their own practice. And that's, that's a parajika. There's another pachitya, which is around uh, not telling your personal, because you could, you could actually tell, I could tell, talk about my own meditation experience to another fully ordained monk. That's what I can do. Like we, we can talk about things, but I cannot talk, it, talk about it to you guys because it's improper. <laughs> and then monks can really, they're, they're human beings like everybody else. The head starts to swell and uh, there's ego and you're just losing the path. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it sounds great when a monk talks about, you know, like... Uh, powers and things like that and uh, it's really impressive so and the Buddha was really clear about these things he was like you're not doing that you just keep quiet on this you can talk within yourselves but and so that's why we also encourage people to not boast about any of that you just keep it to yourself talk about it to your teacher to your friends to the people you're close with so that yeah like Kalyanamittas you know you you want to help each other on the path, but you don't talk about these things openly, really. So, um, so yeah. So in, within the sangha, that's that's why personally I think it's amazing that if if you have a monk that is fully ordained, that person cannot ever have sexual intercourse with anybody, uh, even an, an animal. <laughs> so, just so you know, <laughs> it's yeah. Huh? Yeah, dead bodies, well, that's, yeah, it 
it's like a two lache, yeah. It's a brave offense, which is kind of gross, but anyways. Yeah, that whole part of the vinya is definitely not resplendent, but we have to talk about these things because people did them, so. <laughs> That's why the vinya is in place, like all of these rules, like the Buddha never invented these rules. He said, is he only said it when it happened. Somebody did that, and then he had to say, no, no, no. <laughs> no, you, you can't do that. Like, no, 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 that's not good. Like, <laughs> and um, so our Buddha was actually really wise. Uh, he was, uh, he, you know, not all Buddhas are the same. Uh, some Buddhas do not put down the Vinaya. They do not put down the Patimokkha. And uh, their sasana doesn't last as long. So for us who get this teaching 2,500 years later, the Vinaya, just for uh, your information, is what has been holding all of this together. So that's why we, we, we really, f good monks will be really fond of protecting the virtue because it's protecting the Dhamma also. Uh, if you know, the Buddha had the analogy of a garland of flowers and uh, the Vinaya is actually the string that holds the mala of flowers together from blowing away in the wind, basically. But when there's no vinaya, the flowers just whoosh. So the people get the teaching first, they become awakened, but there's no rules, they just do whatever. And then, and then it just deteriorates extremely fast, and then the teaching is lost within very quickly, a few generations. And th this is quite amazing. So th I guess all of this to say, <laughs> that we're here 2,000, almost 600 years after the Buddha's time, we get the Dhamma, and I see this particular tradition, I've been looking around so many traditions, I've tried so many things, whether it was, yeah, whether it was from yoga to new age, now you all know. <laughs> and this particular teaching has been, for me it's, there's no words. There's absolutely no words to describe my gratitude for this teaching, for Bhante Vimaramsi. I've never encountered anything that came close to this. Um, and I see a lot of people that see the Dhamma uh, in, this, uh, in this circle and have very profound experiences. And it's just so beautiful to see. And they really do experience it. Like it's like, like the Buddha would say, like it's, it's not even, they're not even supported by any teacher anymore. They just know it for themselves. They don't rely on anybody else. They don't need anybody else at that point. That's what it means to enter the stream, is that you have unwavering confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and the virtue. And that, you can practice, you can get there, we can give talks, we can make that accessible, we can give help, but you have to do it. And then, once you understand the Dhamma, it's yours. It's to be experienced by the wise for oneself. And not, to, to have unwavering confidence, avetapasati, that means that nobody can take that away from you. Even if a Mahatera that's been in the rope for 150 years, you know, will come and say to you, you're not, you don't understand, doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> when you know the Dhamma, you know the Dhamma, period. That's it. And you can only deepen that understanding more and more. So, yes, I do see that this day and age, there is a special era happening where there's a really big polar opposites happening, but this is also a conduit for the arising of wisdom. And this is also in a sutta where the Buddha talks about how does, um, how does the path arise in someone, is that when they experience suffering, they see the suffering to a certain degree where it's enough for them to push them to seek to find an answer, to find a way out. That's when we start to, we start walking towards that. So I think this is a time where there are causes and conditions in place that allow that. We, there is a lot of people I see that are ready for the Dhamma and that they're actually genuine about it. So.
Welcome, friends. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, like the awakened people, like the Arya Puggalas. Yeah, I mean... Because the Putujana, Putujana is basically someone who hasn't entered the stream, basically, yeah. So Putujana is basically s someone, uh, just a regular person who's just living day-to-day -day life and never heard about Dhamma and never... Uh, there, there are, yeah, there's plenty. I mean, the, that, that word Putujana is from the Buddha's own discourses, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Kondanya was the first one, uh, listening to the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, the setting, rolling the wheel of Dhamma. And he was the first one to basically listen to Dhamma, the first discourse of the Buddha. Well, it, might, it was many discourses, but he finally got there. We just call it the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, but there's a preamble to this. <laughs> so, um, and uh, that's the first mention of the Dhamma Chakku arising, the vision of the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, now Kondanya, Anya Kondanya knows, he knows and he sees, basically. And that's when the wheel started turning, because that was the first disciple. And then many other people, I mean, at the time of the Buddha, people had amazing faculties just to be reborn in the, in the Buddha era is just amazing karma in itself just to be like in the presence of a buddha uh, so a lot of and not only did they have good faculties and good conditions in their life good karma but they also had a buddha <laughs> i mean i'm not the buddha like i'm pretty far from it uh, and you know, like listening to a Buddha or listening to me is quite different. <laughs> like I might say good things once in a while, but like when you have the Buddha in front of you and he, like he's the Dhamma, you know, he's the, he's the Tathagata. So they have really good conditions and faculties and they also have the Buddha. And so, of course, when he's like saying that, there's like, you know, this, his tone of voice, his like, like he's there, you know, like, and you can actually like be with him, basically. Uh, that really helps a lot, too. As a lot of people, and I mean, what we get is like, uh, you know, 2,600 years diluted kind of version, and even though it's quite proven that it's really authentic for most of it. Like you, you can read the Bhikkhu Sujato's book, The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Text, which is excellent to prove that. It's amazing the proofs that he comes up with, and it's really good for the faith, uh, actually reading that book. Uh, though we can definitely see that it, it probably that's not the way that the Buddha talked, <laughs> like repeating everything like 10 times, you know, like so that's really an aid for memory and memorizing the text, which was the way that it was preserved in the early times. So, I mean, we're, we, it's still so amazing that we have even access to these texts. I mean, it's just crazy to just think about that, that it's been preserved in such a pristine way, even though it's slightly modified. I mean, you can read the Agamas too, which, you know, they, they have crossovers, which are like the, like the Chinese equivalent that they found not too long ago. And uh, it's quite, it's different, but you can see a lot of similarities. So. Uh, and these are completely like two complete different branches that split like really early on, like a few hundred years, on like maybe 200, I'm not sure, I can't remember, but uh, <laughs> 100 or 200 years, <laughs> something like that. And they, there is no like connection in between like the Pali Canon and the Chinese Agamas, but they have, m most of the suttas are really similar and uh, uh, they're, Formulation will be different, but you get the core of it. You, you see that it's like, yeah, it's, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, it's, the thing is that that sounds like a designation of uh, the different kinds of people. Yeah, yeah, that sounds very Abhidhamma-ish. Yeah. Yes, yes, the first book probably. And uh, Pugala, I can't remember. I don't read the Abhidhamma. Huh? Yes, very good. Excited. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Excited. 
Oh, everybody, yeah, is very excited now. <laughs> it was thrilling towards the end there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so anybody's got some more post-its? No? Questions? Answers? Comments? Oh. <laughs> there we go. I think the suttas would kind of contradict that. I think, I think you can't really experience both at the same time. While well, he may be in between, but uh, like infinite space and infinite consciousness. Because the way that the Buddha explains it is like going entirely beyond basically the, Spain, the plane of endless space. One would enter upon and abide in the, spa uh, the plane of endless consciousness. So going entirely beyond it. So there's a kind of a retracting, basically, of awareness. Some people say it's like uh, the jhanas are like they go like they expand and expand and expand and expand until infinite space, and then they start kind of collecting again. That's the analogy that people say. It's not really what happens, but yeah, <laughs> it kind of does feel like that sometimes yeah because yeah and then in this consciousness is like that spaciousness is like kind of like the body like of of mind but at some point just that it just like it's too again it's too coarse it's too like big and then the awareness just starts to kind of detach from that and it starts to go more towards like uh, really witnessing itself because it's just like, it's disinterested with like such great, you know, it's, it's too much. And then it just goes like, okay, and then it starts witnessing itself. And then when it gets enough of itself, you know, through letting go, letting go, letting go, then it, it remains steady. Because, yeah, because of wisdom. So. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. I thought there was a raised hand. Some, some brave people here. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's share our merits. Oh, yes. Uh, are you going to be speaking more about uh, causality in the coming uh, Yes, that's, that's the agenda. Okay. I don't, I don't know any... Yet. I, I never know the talks I'm going to be going to give until after the interviews or something like that. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But there will be some more dependent origination on the menu. So. Uh, for English students, so one can see the dependent origination uh, chart, which is there here. One can see there. Mm. We have a Kuhn's. We have here a chart. Kuhn's chart. For Hindi people, we will try to provide more. Hindi ne. Do we have a Hindi one? Oh. Uh, yes, yes. Acha. Good. Okay. Soka patta jani soka bhaya patta jani bhaya soka patta jani soka hantu sabbe pi bani no idam no punyam sabbe satta no modantu sabba sampatti siddhiya Aga satta ja bhumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anu muritva chirang rakantu sambuddha sasana. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad. Vittayam chakumai karaja Arisavanno Tang Tang Namasami Harisawanam Patawim Pabhar
Sang. Dayanja Gudunta Vihare Muratim. Himbra Mena Veda Gusab Vedhan. Namadu 